Uh, let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, today we have Dr. Marco Paolon. And he's an associate professor of aeronautics and astronautics at Stanford University, where he directs the Autonomous Systems Laboratory and the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. He also serves as a director of Autonomous Vehicle Research at NVIDIA. Before joining Stanford, he was a research technologist within the robotics section at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He received a PhD degree in aeronautics and astronautics from Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2010. And his main research interests are in the development of methodologies for the analysis, design, and control of autonomous systems with an emphasis on, on self-driving cars, autonomous aeros uh, aerospace vehicles, and future mobility systems. He is a recipient of a number of awards, including a Presidential Early Career Awards for scientists and engineers from President Barack Obama, an Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, National Science Foundation Early Career Award, NASA Early Career Faculty Award, and an Early Career Spotlight Award from the Robotics, Science, and Subsystem Foundation. He was identified as a, uh, by the American Society for Engineering Education as one of America's 20 most highly promising investigators under the age of 40. So, looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, since you know, there's a few of us, uh, be happy also to make a conversation as you prefer. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my research on AI safety for autonomous vehicles. I don't have to convince you, but obviously AI is now ubiquitous in modern autonomous stats. Uh, AI has been become uh, predominant uh, in perception, the perception model since 2014. It's now uh, heavily used for uh, prediction for trajectory forecasting. Is not as pervasive uh, yet, I would argue, in the planning stack, but it's getting there. And this is for good reasons, of course. AI techniques in general allow for much better performance than the classical techniques. However, AI is not perfect. Sometimes these AI models can behave in erratic uh, ways. For example, they might behave in, behave in erratic ways in case, in case of anomalous events, like uh, a car, a trailer, or a low flying bird on the left-hand side. They might get uh, uh, uncertain about their predictions. For example, in the picture on the top right, it might be unclear whether the person on the right is a pedestrian or a cyclist, or simply might, they might get confused by out-of-domain objects. Like for example, in the figure on the bottom right, there is an aircraft, which by the way, caused a, a ghost break for one of the Tesla vehicles. Obviously an aircraft typically is not something that you would see on the road. So this makes it challenging to design AI-based autonomy stacks that are high performant and at the same time, fulfill strict requirements in terms of uh, safety. Now, if uh, you want to fulfill strict requirements in terms of safety and you have uh, AI-based models uh, in the loop, what do you do? Well, to be a little bit concrete, let's consider the case of a perception stack and in particular, the problem of object uh, detection. Let's assume that our performance goal is to um, keep the uh, false positive rate as low as possible. Of course, false positives could cause uncomfortable driving because they might cause uh, ghost breaking. Let's also assume that our safety requirement is to make sure that uh, our probability of a false negative detection is bounded and low, say below a notional 10 to the minus 9, and I'll let you add the units. I'm not going to that right now. So one approach to uh, show that actually your system satisfies the safety requirement is to consider um, an, an, an architecture where you have redundant algorithmic pipelines with uh, no common causes of a failure. For example, in this case, we have uh, three algorithmic pipelines based on the three different sensor uh, units. And the point that is that in this way, you can decompose the safety requirement into three independent safety requirements that are much less stringent and therefore much easier to attain. And this is, you know, uh, the uh, core, for example, of a number of standards that uh, companies, for example, need to fulfill if you want to sell your autonomy staff in Europe. Now, while that works well for safety, it might impact performance. In general, these uh, kind of a classical uh, stack tend to have a high false positive rate. So 
the next thing will be to say, okay, so why don't we actually use a, a learned perception fusion engine in order to boost our performance uh, goals? And basically, let the fusion happen in the learned space, uh, uh, in the latent space of a deep neural network. This, of course, would uh, uh, most likely improve our performance goal. For example, one could think of uh, leveraging visual cues in order to correct a possible uh, false detection by the radar pipeline. But on the other hand, now we have a monolithic structure that we can decompose anymore, so it's very difficult to prove that we can achieve the very stringent safety requirement. So then, uh, there is a bit of delay, yes. The strategy will be to bring back your legacy or classical, if you will, um, uh, fusion architecture. So now we have the learned fusion module and we have the classical module with independent algorithmic pipelines. In this way, again, we can uh, achieve uh, the very stringent safety requirement, but now we impact again the performance goal. For example, in the case where uh, one or two of the uh, classical algorithmic pipeline detect uh, a false positive and outvote the true negative that is produced by the learned sensor fusion. Now, the architectural approach in order to have an assured, uh, assured autonomy stack is probably the standard, I would say, in the automotive sector. There is nothing wrong with it. And, uh, but my research goal is to see to what extent we can actually provide assurances through algorithmic advances in the different AI models in such a way that we can use AI while minimizing as much as possible additional uh, architectural um, you know, pipelines. On top of it, of course, the legacy system also consume resources, both in terms of real estate on your chip and in terms of power consumption. So uh, this is a big problem. So this drives basically my research on uh, algorithmic AI safety. So basically we work on, we target advancements on uh, how we uh, design AI system, how we deploy them and how we maintain them through the life cycle. On the design side, we look at techniques for robust training of AI models and techniques to allow AI models to express uncertainty estimates. So basically to allow them to express how uncertainty, uncertain they are in a way that is uh, calibrated and actionable by downstream models. On the deployment side, we look at devising methods for runtime monitoring. That is techniques to constantly keep the AI models in check and detect, for example, whether a distribution shift has, ha has happened, in which case we may want to trigger fail safe or in general contingency maneuvers. And finally, we look at uh, ways to maintain AI models through the life cycle, for example, techniques to intelligently, intelligently sample that uh, at the edge that can be used in order to retrain the model during its life cycle, along with techniques for testing, validating the stack, and in particular simulation. So today I'm going to talk uh, about three main topics, namely uncertainty quantification, anomaly detection, and uh, simulation. Starting with the topic of uh, simulation, that is a topic I'm quite uh, excited about. Any questions so far? All right, so of course, simulation is a holy grail in, uh, as this video is a bit choppy, is a holy grail in the field of robotics. Ideally, if it could develop a system and validate a system in simulation, our life will be much easier. This is a snippet from the simulator that NVIDIA is developing, which is called the drive sim. But of course, simulation obviously is used by most of the companies working on uh, autonomous vehicles but it's not as pervasive as we would like and one of the reasons why it's not super pervasive is that it's very hard to emulate how humans would uh, uh, you know behave on the road by humans i mean uh, uh, drivers cyclists uh, and uh, pedestrians and so on and so forth. So basically replicating all the nuanced ways that a human can behave, in particular when interacting with uh, our ego vehicle, and in a way that is also location specific, obviously the way that uh, a person behaves in the United States is different from the way a person behaves in Italy, is still beyond reach, which basically hampers the uh, widespread use of uh, simulation. Yeah, yeah. 
is it as hard as developing the autonomous driving itself to develop a smart agent in it? Yeah, that's something that is typically, so first of all, when you develop simulation, what you're really interested in is the behavioral part of the agent. So for example, you don't need to, if you will, conceptually develop all the upstream components that uh, are considered perception. So for example, the agents uh, in the system, you can assume that have a full state information about the system. So that already significantly simplifies things. Then, of course, um, so that, that means that it's not as hard as developing uh, anything. Even, of course, very hard. For example, uh, as I will show, I will claim that it's as hard as building trajectory, a very good trajectory forecasting model, actually it's even harder. So, of course, there is a lot of commonality with the difficulty of building AVs, but they are not this, the exactly same challenges, and it's not, I would say, the same difficulty end-to-end. -end. And, of course, in order for these behavioral models to be useful, you don't need to be perfect, but at least better than game-like logic that do not really stress test uh, uh, a vehicle, for, for example, in corner cases. So the question here is, uh, how can we build intelligent agents to generate realistic human-like driving behaviors? Now, of course, there has been a lot of research in the past uh, five to six years on, uh, as we were saying before, building models for trajectory forecasting. So basically models that allow you to understand what a human is going to do in the next uh, three to four, maybe five seconds, or a little bit more. In my lab in particular, we'll be looking at uh, generative models of uh, human behaviors. So briefly, what we want to do is to, and by now this is fairly standard, and I'm sure that you're using something similar to it, to learn a probability distribution P about the future human, human actions, U sub H T plus one, conditional on the interaction history, XU, and uh, highlighted in gray, and the conditional on a future candidate robot action, U sub R T plus one. The history of an interaction, for example, could be the history of relative poses between the car and the other agents that are in close proximity on the road. And basically condition the history allow us to uncover latent behaviors such as aggressiveness or alertness. And conditioning on the future or on the next robot action allow us to capture the interactive aspect of the interaction. So basically, and I'm sure that you're doing something very similar to this, you use these models to say, okay, if the robot were to change lane, what would be the possible responses from the humans? And then you act accordingly. What is X? So X and U is basically the joint state or relative state between the ego vehicle and the other vehicles. For example, it could be relative distances or relative speeds and so on and so forth. Typically for the past one to three seconds. Oh, yeah. D is the current time, T plus one is the next time. So in my lab specifically, we have building over the we have been building over the years a particular type of uh, model based on a conditional variation out encoder model called the trajectron plus plus that can ingest as a, a conditioning data a vast set of heterogeneous data from dynamical information of course the way that uh, a pedestrian uh, the dynamics of a pedestrian are very different different from the dynamics of a cyclist all the way to maps inform map information that can encode for example crosswalks information the road boundaries and all the way to human silhouette for example in order to properly predict pedestrians we have been testing uh, these algorithms in uh, interactive decision-making scenarios with, uh, with on one of the self-driving cars that I have in my uh, lab at Stanford, the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. And the Sarah can, of course, recognize this vehicle very well. She's a, it is the X1. She uh, helped with, uh, of course, maintaining it and building it. The role of the human uh, or the human driver is taken by a small RC car that you can barely see. The reason why we use an RC car is that since we are stress testing the algorithms in very interactive scenarios, traffic weaving in this case, we want to make sure that no one gets injured in case of uh, a failure. And the elements of this model actually have been now productized by NVIDIA and are part of a prediction net, which is the network that NVIDIA uses for trajectory forecasting here, for example, forecasting features of uh, other vehicles on the road in a highway merge situation. Okay, so 
I would argue that by now we have pretty good models for trajectory forecasting. I would say you know, there is still a lot of research, but I would say there are diminishing returns in what we can achieve. So the question is, can we, do, can we then just extend such generative prediction models to build realistic traffic models? If you think about the task of uh, forecasting human trajectories, it's very similar to the task of emulating how they would drive in uh, simulation. But before getting to the answer to the question, let me first state a little bit the desiderata for a simulation model. I would claim that typically for a, simula for a simulation behavioral model, we have a four key desiderata. Fidelity, can we synthesize agent group behaviors that resemble real world traffic? Diversity, can we generate a wide range of realistic traffic patterns? Controllability, can we steer the traffic model to generate a specific scenario? And then adaptivity, can we adapt to new regions of the world, say, Sicily in Italy from, from where my wife is from, with a little to no tuning. This is essential in order to scale our stack. If every time we go into a new region, we have to retain everything from scratch, the business doesn't scale and we don't have a product. But we face a, num a number of challenges. In particular, stability. We want to make sure that uh, the simulation does not diverge from reasonable behaviors uh, after just uh, a few seconds. And uh, long horizon simulation. We want basically to run the simulation for minutes and even hours that is for a horizon that is much longer than the training data horizon. So, yeah. Why do we need like this last challenge uh, to have this much more horizon? Because usually when we are like testing, we still use very short horizon. For simulation? Yeah. Well, I mean, typically you still want to have uh, 20, 30 seconds of interaction. As I will show in the next slide, if you just close the loop naively on these prediction models, in the matter of just a few seconds, you get out of distribution and you get nonsensical behavior. Yes. Okay, so, 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 so uh, saying much more horizon, you mean like from five seconds to twenty seconds, not just twenty, minutes, thirty seconds. No, no, not minutes and hours. I mean, of course, the longer the matter, but specifically you want to have the impacts in the order between twenty seconds to one minute, depending on maybe you have very complicated interactions with the unprotected left turns, and maybe you have to wait at a stop, and so it might involve over a minute. But certainly, something that goes beyond the four, five seconds, or six, seven seconds, that is typically mm -hmm. the case for prediction models. And most importantly, you want to close the loop on uh, these prediction models, right? Because you want to have reactive behavioral models. So my point here is that uh, just naively using prediction models for the purpose of simulation does not quite work. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing a video of, uh, oops, let me go back. Of a vehicle, and this is because, uh, you know, just replaying a trajectory from a driving lab. Now, in the right video, what they do is they take a state-of-the-art prediction model and then close the loop on it. So basically, the uh, vehicle starts from the same initial condition from the drive log, drives for a little bit along its predicted trajectory, and then it closes the loop on it, and then you recompute the trajectory. And all of a sudden, the simulation stops in the middle, you know, the vehicle stops in the middle of the road. And the reason why this happens is that basically the model quickly diverges from uh, situations that it knows how to handle, and then its output becomes erratic. So basically the model goes out of distribution, it freaks out, and then uh, the output becomes completely nonsensical. So the question is, uh, how do we fix this problem? And our approach is actually relatively simple and uh, entails the idea of uh, uh, modeling the problem through a uh, hierarchical structure. So basically, we step, we uh, try to emulate how we as humans do driving. First, we decide where we want to go. So we set goals and then we decide how to go there. So basically there are two sorts of uh, levels. And uh, that's basically what we do with uh, our approach. Uh, on the left-hand side, we show our simulation model whereby we learn how to set the goals, which are sampled from a spatial probability map that is learned and is shown on the right. And then we have a goal conditional policy that is a regress from data that tells the vehicle how to reach the goal. So basically disentangling the problem of goal generation from the problem of uh, uh, goal conditioning policy generation, we dramatically simplify the mutation problem and this enables better generalization. Of course, there are a few uh, details here, but 
That's basically the gist of it. So it's a relatively simple insight, and it works actually quite well. So this allows us to simulate all sorts of uh, realistic uh, driving behaviors in a fully data-driven way, roundabout uh, intersections, and so on and so forth, and also allow us to generate uh, basically counterfactual driving uh, scenarios, thereby exposing an autonomous stack to an unprecedented amount of uh, experiences. Now, of course, the question is how well does this work? Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, what they show is some vehicles moving around. Is it really realistic? Is it really sensical? And it's a very difficult question because it's back again to one of your previous questions. So measuring realism is in itself uh, a challenge. It's a challenge because obviously we don't have a, a clear mathematical definition of what realism means. And also we cannot really compare to ground truth uh, data set uh, trajectories because we want to generate a new and diverse scenario. So by the way we define the problem, we don't have a ground truth we can compare with. So what we do is to basically to come up with uh, different types of uh, metrics. The first type of metrics, which we refer to as rollout metrics, basically measure low level quantities related to the trajectory rollouts. So for example, uh, the coverage of these trajectories, so how dispersed they are, um, how diverse they are through each other by basically measure, measuring the Wasserstein distance between the different uh, trajectory rollouts, and then uh, measuring uh, how often these trajectory, for example, end up in uh, off-roading situations or collision situations and so on and so forth. We have statistical type of metrics whereby we compute uh, statistical quantities from our simulated trajectories, like for example, speed and jerk, and we compare these uh, uh, statistical quantities to what we would observe in uh, uh, a data set. And finally, we have the human likeness score scores, whereby we measure the likelihood of a simulation rollout by using uh, one of the prediction models that uh, I uh, presented before. So basically jointly, all these metrics pre provide a picture of the weaknesses and strengths of uh, all of the methods. Our methods that is called BITS and whose bar is uh, presented in green, uh, broadly outperforms all the other state-of-the-art uh, traffic models that have been proposed uh, in the past uh, couple of years. And more details are provided in the uh, in an ECA paper that is going to show that is going to appear in a in a month or so. Okay, so this works well in the sense that uh, it seems to provide decently realistic, at least in the sense of the metrics that I discussed before, and the diverse traffic rollouts. But one other important desideratum, as I mentioned before, is that of controllability. So how do we make sure that we steer the simulation toward cases that we are really interested in and stress tests our autonomous car. Most of the driving is very boring. And if I just simulate a boring, uh, straight, uh, constant speed type of uh, traffic in a highway, it's completely useless. So to that, basically, we use uh, uh, techniques from uh, um, differentiable logic to basically provide specifications that then are used as guidance for diffusion models. So diffusion models are, uh, you know, a generative model that has become quite popular in the past uh, few years. And uh, there is a way, and basically it's a model that's also been used quite a bit uh, for the purposes of uh, trajectory prediction and simulation. And one of the nice things about this model is that we can uh, guide their denoising process. And uh, the idea here is to use uh, signal temporal logic formulas that are differentiable in order to guide this denoising process and making sure that the trajectory that generate uh, fulfills some um, uh, you know desired um, uh, specifications like for example here let's assume so, so, so like maybe it's a classified guided sampling for it's not really classifier so basically these are models that loosely speaking learn how to start from noise and then uh, distill something of interest, like for example, an image or a trajectory. And so basically this model is trained with data. Yeah. In this yes. denoising process, basically at each step, you have a conditional probability distribution. And basically you can kick a little bit the mean of that probability distribution 
by injecting gradient from these uh, logic formula. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, so uh, the inject one is like some classifier or some like neural net where you can compute. Yes, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a actually a differentiable version of the logic formulas. But yes, you can also use other type of uh, um, biases that you can use in order to guide the knowledge process, absolutely. We use STL because it's a relatively transparent way of encoding specifications, but you can also use other ways to provide biases to the knowledge process. Yeah. And the, um, I don't know, like maybe this one is like offline, so latency is not a concern, but like how do you, is it? Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is offline. It's not meant to run the car. On the other hand, the latency is not actually that big of an issue. I don't have the exact numbers on top of my mind, but we're not talking about hours and supercomputers. We're talking about a few seconds at most. Yeah. So let me show how this works. So let's assume that uh, basically we have uh, the three cars at the bottom that uh, with our original model with no guidance go through the intersection and then along the road. At the bottom, actually, we use this uh, guided uh, diffusion process whereby we specify that uh, all the vehicles, for whatever reason, have to stop in those uh, uh, squares. And this is not obvious because basically shaping the output of uh, an opaque neural network model is hard. So actually we were quite happy that we could very carefully control the output of these neural network models according to some uh, specifications. Why is it useful? For example, in this way, we can generate uh, simulations whereby we can say, I want some of the drivers show inauthentic driving whereby they do not stop at stop sign or whereby they don't, do not yield and so on and so forth. And we can easily now inject through this approach this information uh, into our simulation models, thereby making, making the simulations controllable. I have a question. So um, I think like you also present another message, which is like a, things like goal conditions, yeah. clear, right? So if you just are like fixing the goal as what you have here, would it still provide the same thing? Like is diffusion model necessary? Like you know, in your previous method, you were saying like there's a two hierarchical approach, right? Yeah. To estimate the goal distribution, but then you know, say that's a great the fix the goal distribution to be the condition that you want to go in. So the goal for, for this specific example, yes, you yeah. could. Yeah. But for more uh, difficult examples, like for example, uh, I want uh, people show a behavior whereby they do not stop a stop sign or do not yield a stop sign. So something that goes beyond just positional information, it will be harder to just do it uh, by reasoning in, in terms of goals. I see. But like for the case where I say, you know, the driver doesn't obey the stop sign rule, do you have to train some model uh, to provide such? No, no, no. As I said, it basically that information will be encoded yeah, probably this is not the clearest figure, but uh, it will be encoded into a logic formula. Logical formula? Logical formula. So it's a particular type of logic referred to as a signal temporal logic. It's basically um, uh, a formula that is made by atomic proposition and some of the negatives. And uh, in previous works, we have shown actually with the colleagues at CRI that uh, these formulas can be made differentiable and then they can be included in a full differentiable framework that is basically the diffusion model. I see. So you could, I mean, the simplest possible thing to do is just to prescribe a goal because this basically is a static uh, formula. But you can do something that is much more so sophisticated and also has a temporal component. And that's, I think, the beauty of this approach. I see, okay. Maybe like one more question is like, um, so for, this one, I mean, still seems like it's not fully data driven because you human has to come up with these tools. I mean, the simulation is fully data driven. The way you want to control it, yeah. it's yeah. up to the human. Yeah, That's a very good point. Uh, in some cases, that's good because as a human, you have a good intuition about the particular corner cases that you're interested in, but not always, which bring us actually to the work that we're doing right now. That is, whoops, skipping here. So what we're going to do with this is a sort of a text to simulation of store, where actually now the guidance will be provided by a large language models that can translate into language specification. For example, police reports or reports of the collisions that have happened. And that we want to you know, stress test our AV stack 
against those scenarios. So as you said, this will be it's our attempt and now that we're looking at at uh, in order to remove one of the weak points that is basically relying on uh, human level guidance to really make the full, I mean, almost all of the pipeline fully automated and data driven. But we still need this uh, like language part. So it's yeah, uh, that's what I say. Almost. I mean, it's still. Uh, it's not that we are. Uh, uh, I mean, likely so, right? Otherwise, we'd all be laid off, and uh, uh, there wouldn't be work for us. Of course, uh, you still need to have the language part. You still have to provide prompting for the language model so that you know, the human is completely out of the loop. But at least you are abstracting increasingly more what the role of the human is from. Uh, prescribing as it was until maybe a couple of years ago, all the behaviors at the level of game-like logic to actually make the models more data-driven, but with guidance that is prescribed, all the way to guidance that is also data-driven, and then you can really say, uh, I want to generate uh, this accident that has happened uh, uh, three years ago to see what our AV stack would have done, and then basically this would allow us to Build a simulation, and this is really generative AI on steroids. We are not generating images, we are not generating videos, we are not generating scenarios, we're generating, generating behaviors. So, basically, policies that react to what your eco vehicle does. Um, do you still have this STL rules? Yes, basically, the STL is the grounding for the language. For the somehow, basically, these uh, um, language models had to be grounded. So, in robotics applications, there are different ways to ground them. For example, in that can be grounded in value functions if you're doing manipulation in our case they will at the end be grounded in uh, logic formulas could be grounded in other ways so far this has been quite convenient for us so, so that's what we've done so we will still need some uh how to say supervision here okay. yes yeah we need, we need the data set yeah make in between upper left part and the steel rows right yep yeah that's right Cool. So basically, Jet AI is the key enabling tool for us to achieve high fidelity, diverse, and controllable simulation. So currently, we're working on a number of uh, different things. So first, combining large language models and behavioral models to enhance diversity and controllability. And we are actually working quite uh, hard on it on, on the NVIDIA side. Second, models that uh, can uh, adapt in a few shots to new environments. So we have some preliminary results where we use the uh, Meta learning ideas to uh, use models that were you know, trained in one region, and with just a few demonstrations, apply those models uh, to um, other regions. A simple one was, for example, taking data from Singapore and applying to Boston. The difference is that in uh, Singapore, people drive uh, on one side, and Singapore, they drive on the other side. I mean, of course, it's something that uh, as a human, you could have done it very easily, but just to stress test that, yeah. Yeah, really use like meta learning techniques here, like, um, for example, MAML or something like that. It's, uh, no, it's, or, it's, it's not exactly MAML, it's more related to uh, a work that uh, I did with one of my former students at uh, Stanford, where basically we do adaptation with respect to the last layer of the neural network by using Bayesian methodology. Mm -hmm. So the very high level, the concept is the same, but it's not exactly mm -hmm. Um That's a good question. I mean, perhaps we could also do it with mammal. The reason why we did it in these other ways is that this computation would be more efficient. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really need the complexity of mammal. Anyways, uh, working obviously on fidelity models of uh, other agents on the road. So far, we're mostly focused on uh, cars. So we want to also model cyclists. Uh, we're working on infrastructure. We currently released uh, most of our SIM infrastructure. Uh, the package is called the TBSIM. Uh, there are a bunch of models that are implemented, including the bits and a bunch of uh, infrastructure that you can use, for example, to interface your model with popular data sets uh, that uh, are available in the community. And of course, we're working on integrating these models in uh, safety evaluation workflows. So a lot of great questions. And we are already 30 minutes in. So, Alexander and all of you, it's up to you. Do you prefer to talk about uncertainty quantification or anomaly detection? Anomaly. Anomalies, okay. So we'll be super brief about uncertainty quantification. So uncertainty quantification basically is the problem of, I have a model, how do I uh, derive um, uncertainty estimates that are uh, calibrated? And by calibrated here, I mean that uh, the probability that the true level 
belongs to the set of possible levels that your model outputs is greater than a given threshold. So there is a technique that has been around for the past 20 years or so, which is called conformal prediction, which basically allows you to take any machine learning model with any heuristic notion of uncertainty, softmax, prob softmax probabilities, whatever, and then turn that model with that heuristic notion of uncertainty into a calibrated notion of uncertainty by leveraging a calibration data set. It's a relatively simple procedure. I won't go through it uh, in the interest of time. But my message is that if you are interested in uncertainty quantification and uh, trying to find ways to better calibrate your uncertainty so that they're more, a little bit more transparent uh, for use in downstream decision making, check out conformal prediction. It's a very interesting technique. Uh, I would suggest that evidence that is provided uh, in the bottom left is very easy to, it's not from a lab, it's not from a lab, it's from a lab at Berkeley. And it's very easy to read and uh, very insightful. So my suggestion is check it out if you're interested in you and certainly quantification, especially in a calibrated uh, uh, way. So now in detection, so of course with uncertainty quantification, what you can do is to characterize known unknown. So basically working with your training data set to see how you can come up with the measures of uh, how your model will be uncertain with respect to test inputs that are still generated from your assumed uh, distribution from which also your training data is generated. What if you have a distribution shift? So something anomalous has happened. So how do you catch those cases? And then how do you um, use that information in order to enact, for example, contingency maneuvers? So the problem essentially is uh, as follows, and I'm sure that all of you are quite familiar with it. So, um, let's assume, and here for the sake of uh, the argument, let's consider an example whereby we have uh, an aircraft which uses a, a camera system to um, estimate the lateral displacement error between the position of the aircraft and the center line of the runway, and the task is to track the center line of the runway. And let's assume that this network has been uh, trained in, in clear morning lighting conditions. Then the, the lateral estimate, uh, uh, I mean, this uh, the estimate of the displacement error is used by downstream controller, even a proportional controller, in order to align the aircraft with the center line of the runway. So the point is that if uh, the environment changes, for example, we are at night, you might have uh, um, you know, images that are very different uh, out of domain with respect to your training distribution, and then your model might freak out and give you erroneous lateral displacement information, which in turn would destabilize the system. So the question in anomaly detection is how do you augment a neural network with a monitor that picks up those situations and then uh, provide a nominal signal to a downstream controller to at least let the controller know that something weird is happening. Now, of course, you will have to do this with a minimal compute overhead with respect to your neural network. The monitor is basically additional baggage that you have in your autonomy stack. So you really want to compute, uh, you want to have a computational footprint that is minimal. And ideally you like to avoid training a bunch of additional networks and doing complicated ensembles and so on and so forth. So how do you do that? The first thing to do it is first to define the notion of auto-distribution, which is a bit nebulous notion. At the high level, probably we understand what that means. But when you try to devise a monitor, it becomes really tricky to really understand what is the definition you want to work with. So the typical definition of an auto-distribution sample is as follows. A sample, like an image, is uh, deemed to be auto-distribution if it is uh, far enough from the samples that have been seen at the training time, which kind of makes sense. It's probably the most intuitive definition of auto distribution. However, defining a notion of a distance in hard to define manifolds, such as the space of images, is hard. And second of all, basically this procedure assumes that uh, uh, you need to store all your training data in your car in order to compute these distance computations. So this basically, a strategy that fundamentally doesn't scale and is very compute intense and memory intense. You might say, okay, uh, we talked a lot about generative models. So one possible approach 
would be to use generative modeling in order to uh, build, uh, 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 in order to you know learn a distribution of uh, the training data, and then say that uh, um, a sample is out of distribution if it is not in the support or in the, or the training data or the likelihood is very low. In reality, this makes more sense when you reason about sequences of uh, samples, and then basically you say, I mean, the probability that the sequence of samples is generated by this uh, distribution is very low, hence this sequence is uh, out of distribution. Unfortunately, in robotics and autonomous driving, we are more interested in per sample characterization as a force. I mean, you want to say, okay, this image is completely out of distribution, yes or no, as opposed to a long stream of images. And or in any case, even if you want to consider you know, sequences of uh, samples, typically in robotics, the, the sequences are highly correlated. Of course, there is a temporal component with physics involved. So basically, the theoretical justification for this method for robotics applications become a little bit shaky. But more importantly, this approach and also the previous approach are completely disconnected from the prediction task. They only reason about uh, the input and not how changes in the input might cause changes in the output, which is what we care because we're interested in closed loop control. So in our work, we actually embrace the notion of auto distribution that we refer to as a, a functional uncertainty definition, whereby we deem a, a point, a sample, as auto distribution if it is not uh, well constrained by the training data. So for example, in the image on the right, you have many plausible models that could fit the data. The data is represented by the gray circles. For uh, the green point, basically all the models uh, agree. So we say that we deem that point as in distribution, while for the other points, we the two red ones, we say that they are out of distribution. Okay, you know? why is, why is That's where we're going, yes. So how do we compute it? The intuition uh, So the idea, uh, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, is really standard uh, Bayesian regression. So first, we choose a prior distribution over functions. Let's assume that we have a toy example where we have a, a scalar function that is mapping one scalar on the horizontal axis to one scalar on the vertical axis. Then uh, given the data, we compute a posterior over this function class and then we evaluate the predicted uncertainty at uh, test points. And then if there is a lot of uncertainty for a given test point, then uh, we deem that point as auto distribution. So this is a definition of auto distribution that we like because it really reason in terms of inputs that will be particularly damaging from an output point of view because the output is not well constrained. And so having then a downstream controller that acts on this information that is so uncertain could be dangerous. But how do we do this Bayesian uh, you know, procedure in the case when we don't have a scalar function, we have a neural network? So our approach to that is called a SCUD. So what SCUD does is uh, literally to apply this uh, three-step uh, Bayesian methodology, but taking into account that we're working with uh, a high-dimensional neural network as opposed to a scalar function. So the first step, is to define a prior over the space of uh, functions mapping the high dimensional input space of the neural network into the output space. So our approach to define this class, this prior class of functions is to take the trained neural network, linearize it with respect to the weights, and then impose a Gaussian prior with respect to the weights. So literally uh, we have a family of uh, uh, networks that are uh, parameterized by displacement with respect to the strained uh, uh, weights. If we set this displacement vector delta w equal to zero, then we obtain the trained neural network. So by definition, this prior uh, includes functions that fit well the training data set, assuming that we have done a good job with training the neural network. and. Mm, uh, just uh, sorry for disturbing you. Why do we need to linearize here? In order, for example, if we have linearization, then if we like, like uh, uh, using this Gaussian prior, prior, we still will be inside the Gaussian Gaussian prior, right? Yep. The 
services. Yeah, but now we have a linear dependency with respect to the weight delta W. And so we can do analytic posterior inference with respect to the weights. So that's the only reason why we do this linearization, because in that way, once we bring in the data, then we can do we can compute the posterior of these weights. And this is really the standard uh, uh, Bayesian regression 101 uh, posterior uh, steps. Okay. okay, so so we don't need to do this like heuristically. We have like analytic. You can do it exactly, analysis. but the um, posterior, the covariance for the posterior over the weights depend on the Hessian of the training loss with respect to the weights. So it's a very high-dimensional object. So theoretically, this is an analytical procedure. In practice, uh, is a, we have to deal with a very high-dimensional object. So the insight we exploit here, and that's the, the crux of this approach, is that for over-parameterized uh, um, models, such as a deep neural network model, this Hessian has a very uh, fast spectral decay. So we can approximate it uh, very efficiently in terms of low rank factors. And we use uh, matrix sketching methods in order to compute such a low rank uh, approximation. Typically, just with the 50, 60 topic and values, you can find a good approximation to this covariance matrix. So, so that's where we have the approximation in basically computing these uh, covariance with respect to the weights. So conceptually, the covariance is analytical, but then we compress it. So once we have that, then again, there is the third step, which is the easy one. We propagate uh, the um, distribution information about the weights into distribution information about the output. And then uh, this predictive uncertainty is uh, translated into an analytical notion of uh, uh, anomaly by computing the entropy of this predictive uncertainty. So basically, if this entropy is you know, very flat, then the entropy will be large. That corresponds to situations whereby our network is very uncertain about the value of the output. And so we flag that as out of distribution. Commercially, we flag that as in distribution. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, is the prior P of W or P of X, and is the posterior P of X conditioned on W or P of W conditioned on X? So, uh, where are you looking, sorry? So X, I will assume is, so, okay, so X is the input. So the posterior is related to the training data. So it will be P of W, conditional on the D if D is the symbol of the data set. Importantly, in this model is linear with respect to the weights, but still not linear with respect to the input. So the class of the prior functions that uh, we use is very, uh, is very general and expressive. So let me show how this works, going back to the example of the taxi system. So here, remember that we have this camera that is uh, um, uh, taking you know, images of the runway translating that into lateral displacement error, and then that is used by controller to track the runway. So we assume that uh, the network is only trained in a clear morning lighting conditions. And uh, on the right-hand side in the plot, on the x-axis I have time, on the y-axis I have the magnitude of the anomaly signal. Every time the error makes a significant displacement uh, error mistake, it's uh, leveled with uh, x. So, so far, everything is nominal. There are no black axes, which means that the network is producing correct information. But when we move into afternoon conditions, there are shadows. And for whatever reason, shadows actually uh, create trouble for the neural network. And all of a sudden, the network starts making uh, estimation errors. You see a lot of black axes. Error for us means uh, an uh, estimate of lateral displacement is larger than uh, one meter. But fortunately, this information is picked up in real time by the monitor. This runs at about, I mean, on a desk at about uh, 500 hertz. And uh, it's very, very lightweight. So this we know that we're operating in a situation that uh, where our network is not really reliable. Now you might say, why didn't you include uh, information from, I mean, images from the afternoon in the training of your near, near, net, of your near network. Of course you would. Uh, you will include afternoon, you will include night, you will include fog and clouds and so on and so forth. The point here is to say that no matter how much you do, you're always going to find situations where stuff, weird stuff happens. And this monitor seems to be quite good at picking up those situations. Of course, the technical analysis is also part of the story. 
then the other part of the story is what we do with it. So we have been doing also quite a bit of work on understanding how to tune and use these uh, anomaly signal in terms of uh, switching from a deep neural network dependent controller to uh, a safety maneuver, like for example, stopping here. And uh, we are also using these monitors for the purposes of uh, um, data life cycle. So here the idea is that uh, these uh, points that are deemed as anomalous could actually be quite useful from the point of view of retraining, model retraining. So we have done actually this study in the context of uh, an out of space application where we were training a network for pose estimation of a satellite. Here, the only thing that you have to be careful about is that not only you want to uh, highlight anomalous events, you want also to make sure that the events that you send back to the cloud are also diverse in order to not flood the bandwidth. This is something that we've been working quite a bit at NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA starting next year is going to, I mean, this is all open knowledge, is going to deploy its software on all the Mercedes vehicles. So there will be like millions of vehicles driving around with the perception tech. And of course, do you want to use that in order to leverage information that you can use for model retraining? But, you know, 50 vehicles generate, what, two petabytes of data per day? Imagine what the six million vehicles would do. So that's why these methods or the Latin methods, I think are going to be extremely important from the point of view of the AI infrastructure of your company. So, yeah, so right now the anomaly signal is conditioned on each timestamp. So we look at uh, each sample point uh, uh, point wise, but we're currently also extending this methodology to reason about uh, um, temporally correlated sequences with the idea that maybe you might have a fluke from time to time, but it is not something that is worth uh, uh, signaling because it will be filtered out by some, you know, downstream uh, uh, low pass filter. So what I want to conclude you with is, uh, this seems to work quite well, uh, but is this sufficient? And my answer is, unfortunately, no. And let me motivate you with this video from a Tesla dashboard. So what you see here are a bunch of traffic lights that are spawned by a truck. So this doesn't make any sense. But when you look at the scene, actually it does make sense. So there is a, a truck that is actually carrying traffic lights. <laughs> And this is another case, another, uh, uh, case that actually is causing trouble. So basically there is a stop sign that is printed on a billboard that calls the Tesla to constantly do ghost breaks and uh, causing a lot of uh, complaints. So what is, in, and this actually happens quite frequently. So what is one, when, when you have like millions of vehicles on the road. So what is interesting about this stuff which I refer to as a semantic anomalies, is that we can't say the detector is malfunctioning. We are detecting traffic lights, we are detecting stuff in signs, uh, so there is no malfunction of the detector. So these are anomalies due to the very unusual and very tricky combination of in-distribution events. And unfortunately, everything that I have uh, talked about till now doesn't really catch this type of anomalies. So the point here, though, is that with just a little bit more of contextual understanding, maybe we may be able to detect these semantic anomalies. So how do we include these uh, additional contextual understanding? Again, large language models. This is a topic that I'm very interested in. So the idea is as follows. So we replicated the Tesla case in Carla. So here there was a vehicle driving that stopped in the middle of the road because erroneously the detection module picked up uh, that had a traffic light. So what we do is as follows. We take GPT-3, actually before GPT-3, we take an open vocabulary object detector visual transformer to basically parse the scene and uh, decompose the scene in uh, a bunch of uh, key objects, track tree, traffic sign, and also track carrying a traffic light. And then we feed these into a prompt for a large language model. We use a bunch of uh, uh, well-known uh, tricks to warm start the large language model. So basically we provide to the large language model a few reasoning examples. These are called chain of thought uh, examples. Uh, they're very small, but it's basically, so if you see a bicyclist, is this an anomaly, yes or no? Do you think that this would affect? Uh, so this is basically to allow the LLM to reason about what we care about. 
And then what we do is to pass the information from our visual parser, I basically added it uh, here at the bottom of the input prompt. And then we look at the output and the output is quite interesting. Uh, so basically the LLM analyzes the, all the different objects. For the tree, it says, okay, this is not nothing to worry about. But for the light on the truck, it says, can the vehicle drive safely in the presence? No, this could deceive the vehicle into interpreting the traffic light as a legal traffic uh, signal, classification anomaly. So this was all emergent. This is kind of interesting because for us, these LLMs basically provide the side information that allow us to provide contextual understanding to reason about the semantic analysis. I mean, we have applied these ideas to many other driving cases and also some robotic manipulation cases, but still this is very preliminary research. One thing that we're looking at is, as you probably all know, these LLMs sometimes have the problem of hallucinating uh, uh, explanations. So we're looking at different ways to better ground uh, an LLM, for example, in what is uh, physically possible by a vehicle in order to trim a little bit of these hallucinations. But not all hallucinations are bad. I mean, practitioners and researchers have already been using uh, LLMs in order to do data augmentation. So basically we generate uh, new complicated cases that you can use in order to augment uh, whatever data set you want to augment. Um, of course, our vision is set on uh, multimodal language models. What I have shown so far is a bit convoluted. So we use a visual transformer, parse the scene, and then get a language description of the scene, give it to the prompt. Hopefully with a, a, a visual model, then we can bypass entirely that pipeline and uh, uh, prompt directly um, the language model. Like for example, here, is this following distance sufficient? And, uh, and then get an answer. Now, I don't see this style of reasoning as uh, being in competition with what I discussed before. It's basically complementary to what I discussed before. So we're also working on ways to uh, connect this uh, semantic anomaly detector with uh, the more standard um, auto distribution detector that I explained before in order to have a, a very powerful anomaly detector. So to sum up, runtime monitors, of course, are key to be the high confidence AI systems. We're working on a number of different areas. The ones that I'm particularly most excited about is how to possibly co-train a downstream decision-making logic with the anomaly detector in order to uh, minimize uh, um, useless warnings and how to use language models for the past process of semantic anomalies. And if you're interested in problems related to auto distribution data and robotics with my lab at Stanford, I brought uh, a review paper on this topic that collects references, uh, state-of-the-art references on this topic if you're interested in learning more. So with that, three key messages, generally AI for simulation, conformal prediction for uncertainty quantification, and the you know, potential using runtime monitors to robustify your AI models, in particular, both with respect to more traditional other distribution events and the semantic anomalies. And with that, I'll stop it here. Yeah. I don't know if I have any questions, additional questions. Yeah, let's thank the speaker. Yeah. Well, I should also thank the collaborators, by the way. So both my students at uh, Stanford and uh, the research scientist in my group at uh, NVIDIA. Uh, most of our papers at NVIDIA are actually available on uh, uh, our group website. So you can just download them and if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Just probably have a, like 10, 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, I have a mm -hmm. last question. Well, this anomaly detector, mostly we were talking about uh, perception, like computer vision based anomalies. What about anomalies in behavior itself? Mm -hmm. For example, anomalies drying, et cetera. First of all, what could be the best approach here? Would it be still Bayesian one or not? And can we really right now use light language models for this uh, behavior like anomalies? Okay, so I think there are two questions. So the, the first one is uh, how do we use anomaly detection for uh, behavioral trajectory forecasting models, and then uh, um, in general, and then in particular, whether you can use LLMs for that purpose. Yep. So for trajectory forecasting, so basically anomaly detection can be done in two, two different ways. The one that I explained is what I refer to as input level monitoring. So basically you monitor 
whether the inputs to your system are uh, um, extremely different from what's in a training time, and then you should be careful about the output. And then there is also output level monitoring, whereby basically you look at the output of your model, you see what actually reality looks like, and then if there is a divergence that is accumulating over time, then you know that you shouldn't trust the model. So going back to your question, for trajectory forecasting, we actually been looking at uh, output level monitors. So basically we uh, loosely speaking, look at uh, what our forecasts have been for the past uh, uh, few minutes, uh, hundreds of milliseconds or seconds. We look at what actually the scene uh, has looked like in reality through our observations. And then, of course, if it were in a probabilistic setting, if there is enough distance, then we deem that as an output anomaly. And we had a paper of Coral about it. For input level monitoring, I we haven't done it. I think that uh, uh, it should be applicable to that case as well, but we have worked on it. For LLMs, that's actually something we want to work on. We haven't done it, uh, but uh, I, I think is one of those cases whereby LLMs could potentially shine. Uh, one of the reasons why it could potentially shine is that, uh, in principle, they have also been exposed to, uh, you know, videos or experiences uh, from any many other parts of the world. So it would also help you with uh, applying monitors a bit more broadly as opposed to a specific location. So, but bottom line is that now we haven't used LLM, LLMs yet for trajectory forecasting. I think that's a very exciting opportunity for input monitoring. I think it's definitely possible, but we haven't done it yet. For output level monitoring, we have done it and it works decently well. Decently well. And I can send you the paper if you like. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other questions? I have kind of a high level question. Mm -hmm. So I think what a lot of this research shows is that, uh, you know, it's possible to address like more and more complex situations and scenarios with, uh, you know, uh, augmented systems, right? Combination of uh, machine learning and traditional rule-based methods. Do you feel that that's kind of the approach to, uh, you know, indicate that uh, autonomous driving in particular can reach a certain safety bar to be, you know, deployed generally and generally be trustworthy, essentially like building the right complex system to cover more, uh, more and more cases, enough cases to be safe enough? Or is there going to need to be some other sort of approach to handle, say, cases that you can't necessarily recognize, but can gracefully fail at. I think that the approach, I don't, I don't think there is much controversy here, is that uh, within operational design domains, we can build um, safe systems. And of course, right now the operational design domain is relatively small. And I think one of the key roles of these monitors is to alert you. I mean, the operational design domain, it, most people think is just uh, geofences. But my claim here is that operational design domain goes beyond geofences, goes about basically checking the domain of companies, so these AI monitors and so on. So these monitors are basically a very useful tool in order to understand whether you are going beyond that uh, uh, ODDs, and so you shouldn't trust the system anymore, and you should stop your autonomous driving. So in that way, you when you are within the ODD, I think we have a, as a community, as a industry, I think a good track record of safety. And, uh, but we want to incrementally push this kind of uh, boundaries and to do so in a safe way, I think we need this kind of uh, rail guard. Uh, and of course, there are many other different ways of doing monitoring. I show you my take, but that will be my uh, answer. Now, one interesting thing of uh, NVIDIA specifically, which I don't know if it applies to Europe, but NVIDIA is a supplier. So NVIDIA is going to supply the software to other companies who are not developing our own self-driving car. And so, for example, in supply the software to Mercedes, which happens to be in Europe, which happens to be one of the most heavily regulated markets, not only you have to be safe, but you have to be sure that you are safe. Mm -hmm. And so you have to comply with a number of standards, like the most famous one is ISO 262262. And so, again, these monitors also allow you to build a, a safety case that you can show to regulators. Um, so th they might have different uses from a regulatory standpoint to an ODD detector standpoint to just monitoring what you're doing within your uh, ODD. Uh, there is no silver bullet, but uh, um, 
the fact that, for example, the example that I had at the beginning about the functional decomposition, that is very much inspired by what you need to do currently uh, according to the ISO 262262. You need to have these, uh, basically when you have these very strict uh, safety requirements, uh, you have to decompose them in requirements that are, you know, really verifiable. We don't have yet the technology to just make, uh, um, you know, um, a deep model for sensor fusion, put it in the critical pipeline without redundancy and say, for sure, this is going to be safe. We don't, we don't have the technique, uh, the, 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 those tools yet. So we, need, uh, we, we still need to measure on different levels. Yeah. And then multiply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is no silver bullet. And that was probably the point of this slide that I have here. That's why my safety research, which, you know, it's quite extensive, extensive, but doesn't cover everything. You know, has many different topics because each one of them is interesting in its own right. Here, an interesting one that I haven't listed and not working on is neural net verification. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting topic. Uh, it's a useful one. But for the type of problems I'm looking at, is not high priority for two reasons. There's the computational reason, obviously, that uh, even after years of research, it's still very limited in terms of the type of, uh, type of networks you can deal with. But that's not so much my concern. My concern is that you can, I mean, these tools are useful insofar you can specify what you want to verify. And for, you know, a neural network, for neural network verification, typically the way the problem is posed is if your input is within one set, then you are guaranteed that the output is within another set. This works well, for example, if you have a control neural network, if you start your, you know, the flying of your aircraft and within plus minus your reference trajectory, you're guaranteed that you will stay within plus or minus. That's great. But, you know, we were talking about behavioral uh, trajectory for traffic. How does it, what does it mean to actually, how do you even reason about uh, a set in the input space that for which you want to ensure that somehow gets transformed in some desirable auto space. So the point I'm trying to make is that uh, it's been limited in terms of the specification that you can provide. And in particular, since I'm mostly interested in uh, perception prediction for the part of this of uh, monitoring and safety, that's why we've already do neural net verification. Control is an interesting case, but you know, I mean, I would, uh, even though my background is in control theory, I wouldn't consider like the key bottleneck in the development of this technology. So I'm just chasing the hard equations, I guess. I have a question about the um, ODD. Yeah. I think like, especially in like self-driving case, like do you think the technology you described can be applied here? Like, you know, like, you mean cloud or runtime monitoring in general? I mean, runtime monitoring, of course, is a very broad topic. I'm sure that in your stack you have a tons of monitors, and some of them can be very easy one-line code type of monitors. If the other vehicle is going at 300 miles per hour, probably you have an estimation error. I'm sure there is some sort of e files to the code that says that. I mean, like as uh, cloud. Yeah, I mean, more more like say, because we if we take a image and then trying to say if uh, if you know, there's some, just some anomaly thing that we never see from the training data, right? I, I, I think the question is like, you know, say for example, if uh, we say object detector, right? Like you, you have to detect objects and everything else is a uh, background. Uh, yes, um, even though we don't do object detection in the uh, example that I provided, we literally operate in the space of images. Yeah, I think like my question is like, you know. Um, For semantic anomalies, we do detection. That's basically the vision transformer that uh, I showed before. Even though we would like to skip, as I mentioned, that step going with the multimodal language model. Yeah, I think like what I'm saying is like, you know, for the concept of like, you know, you have uh, your, the data you see, right? And then the data you don't see. I'm just saying like for the context of object detection, you have a positive example, which is like all the vehicle, pedestrian, all those objects. And uh, negative example is everything else. Um, so my question is like, can this kind of concept of like, you know, whether something has been seen in the data or not, 
that technology can be applied to like object detectors say you know these are something that i've never seen like yeah no I, I think it can the only thing that it cannot is uh to provide some um guarantees about the objects that have never been seen because of course there is no way there is nothing that you can really leverage to provide guarantees that your detector will work well in i, I mean everything that i show is quite heuristic right but yes it could be i mean you could also have an object centric we don't have it here and the other thing you should be able to also have an object centric uh, representation to which no. you can apply this monitor no um i think my question is more like uh with a negative example for the what negative example for object detector inactive negative oh negative yes yeah yeah because like mm -hmm. to to train object detector right you, you have to have positive example which yeah i think that is fine like you know we have yeah. this positive example and if you say something new that is doesn't lie in the distribution of positive example and then you can say this is a, a outlier yeah but then detection you also have like a lot of negative example basically negative example to me like if a good detector is like negative example covers everything else yeah uh, and then like in that sense a lot of those ODD kind of like the thing that you never seen, like it would be fall under the uh, like. So, how do you tell like something that is actually a background or is a anomaly for detector case, object detector case? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, it does. Um... Like, Positive one, I think, you know, think you I, have this distribution, then you can. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so we, we haven't applied this methodology to an object centric representation. So I, I don't know, I mean, we haven't done these studies. I would say that in principle, if the background is uh, in distribution, I mean, it's a background that you have seen as part of your training data set, it should be able to distinguish uh, a background from negative objects that haven't been seen in training time. But we haven't done this study, so it has to be seen whether this will work. I don't know. I see. That's a good point. Yeah. Or, or like, you know, for self-driving, like maybe what matters is like you know there's some anomaly objects on the load versus you know like anomaly objects like hanging on some people's tree or house those are you know it doesn't matter oh yeah that's a very good point so we refer to that as a task aware or task driven anomaly detection so basically doing anomaly detection in a way that detects anomalies only only those anomalies that could impact downstream decision making and actually, yeah, we've done a little bit of work. For example, the output monitoring work for behavioral prediction was a task aware. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely something that we have done and other people have done. Um, but the previous question, I don't know, I think it's a very good one and uh, somebody should look into it. I see. I don't know if we have time. Probably, yeah. Time. Uh, time is a lot. Help. Well, you can always uh, feel free to reach out to me. There was another topic that maybe we can discuss next time, which is this idea of uh, differentiable autonomy. So the other big thing that I'm very excited about is the idea of uh, uh, differentiable stacks. So basically, autonomy stacks that uh, are still modular, but uh, many, if not all of the modules are made differentiable so that the stack can be jointly trained with uh, uh, data. And we have had quite good results, for example, in terms of jointly training the prediction to control pipeline, basically differentiating through the uh, RQR trajectory, I mean, the RQR trajectory optimizer, the motion planner, all the way to traffic on plus plus, that in our case was the prediction. And now we're looking at ways to basically back propagate, back propagate gradients even further, all the way to the, the perception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that entails basically two aspects. One, how you make some of the algorithms that are not typically differentiable, such as, you know, Ungarian algorithm or um, core planning, uh, differentiable to a proxy. 
and how you make some of the interfaces uh, either learned or differentiable so that you can propagate cleanings. So we hope to have some results uh, in the next uh, three months that we can uh, share. So in that case, maybe we can talk oh, to each other about it. It would be a nice topic. What's that? It would be a nice topic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks one more time. Right, thank you for thank you very much for the great questions. As I said, 